three sessions originally were one uh, about the uh, yes. conservation planning approach ah, being used the through the IUCN Species Survival Commission. Then there was another one about coordinating um, uh, species conservation plans. And this really came from uh, the SSC Conservation Breeding Specialist Group and from the zoo community. And then there was a third one about developing a system for green listing of well conserved species. And these ideas, they go, there was way too many workshop submissions for the slots available. And so they all got merged into, into, in, in, into one um, uh, session. And so I think several people here have, have actually been working together to merge them. And Liz Bennett, Oni Fires, Mark Stanley Price, Crystal Fritz, and several others. Uh, I congratulate you, congratulate you all for bringing a coherent focus to the whole idea of species conservation planning and actually trying to, to make sure that our conservation plans for species are measurable and, um, and effective. Um, thank you for all coming together. And actually, I think probably the use in coming together to do that is going to have spillover benefits beyond this workshop. And so, 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 so that's really, uh, really, really good. Um, so we welcome you to this. I will just say that um, in SSC, we are putting more and more emphasis on going beyond assessment, beyond red listing, beyond collection of data, to actually moving, uh, moving into multi-stakeholder approaches to conservation planning. And uh, you're going to be hearing quite a bit about that um, in the next um, uh, two hours. Uh, I can only be here for the first half hour, but I uh, look forward to hearing the, um, the, um, the opening talks. Uh, I think, I'm, who am I supposed to hand over to you? I'm hand over to Mark Stanley Price. Now, Mark Stanley Price um, is chair of the Species Conservation Planning Subcommittee of the SSC. Um, in the last quadrennium, no quadrennium before this one, uh, the SSC developed guidelines for, um, uh, for species conservation plans. And uh, having developed the guidelines, we strongly felt that we don't stop the work there we have to roll out the implementation proactively. And so we formed this subcommittee of the SSC with the mandate of really trying to build the capacity in the other SSC specialist groups to go beyond red listing to species conservation planning. And Mark is the person who's been spearheading that. We're extremely grateful to the uh, government of Abu Dhabi who's been funding this work, putting seed funding into this work to, to um, uh, really get it happening across a number of specialist groups. And without any further ado, I think I will then hand over to Mark Sandy Price. Oh, I'm, I should also have pointed out that um, your facilitator today is Dr. John Robinson. And uh, John Robinson is Vice President for International or something like Conservation Programs of the Wildlife Conservation Society, candidate for uh, regional councillor here. And he will be taking over at very short notice to. Um, to um, chair it because Jonathan Bailey um, uh, got called away somewhere else. Um, and uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you. Well, <coughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Simon, for that uh, introduction. Uh, the format this afternoon is we're going to have three talks. And uh, first of all, myself, and then uh, Christoph Schwitzer, and then Liz Bennett. And as Simon said, the product we're going to see now is the result of merging three different ideas together. But I think as it unfolds, I hope you'll see there was a logic to this. And we're moving very much from the present to the near future, to the slightly further future, in species planning. And we obviously hope it will be interesting. And what I'm going to talk about is to show uh, how SSC is approaching species conservation planning now uh, and to show what we have done, what we intend to do in the near future, uh, some of the conditions that we've encountered and uh, some of the challenges. And then in the middle of my presentation, we're actually going to, I'm going to break off and we're going to have another presentation on a specific uh, case history. So uh, why do we need to plan for species? Well, we know that there are many area-based approaches now for, to planning, but for rare species or ones which are threatened, area-based planning is simply not adequate. We have to focus on the species themselves. Uh, but of course, those plans for species must be compatible with any area-based plans or with plans for other species in the same area, and that is a bit of a challenge. 
And I think the point about this quotation from General Eisenhower uh, is that the process of canning is as important as the product. Uh, and I think the second point is, from that is that uh, planning is a dynamic process. Uh, you can produce a plan, but situation changes, circumstances change, and then you must go back to the replanning and planning again <coughs> and, and change as is necessary. And obviously this statement was made during wartime, and quite frankly, maybe the situation for a lot of our species today is rather analogous to wartime. Uh, we deal with changing situations, we have to deal with uncertainty about species, and so on, and so our planning must be uh, flexible and adaptable. <coughs> uh, oh, I'm missing something there. Okay. Uh, and as Simon said, uh, what we're basically doing is introducing the methodology, the approach to species planning, which is in this handbook. And uh, although it's a long uh, web address, it's very easy to uh, find on the SSC website. And uh, we are, in a sense, a disciplinary subcommittee. So we look across all taxa and across all sub uh, habitats and across all specialist groups. Uh, and of course, we're not the uh, only organization doing species planning. So one of the things we want to do is to increasingly converge on the planning approaches of other organizations like WCS, uh, BirdLife International, uh, and the uh, Wetlands International. Uh, and of course, we have close links with the conservation breeding specialist group, who you will hear a bit more about after me. Uh, and a lot of our methodology owes to the pioneering research that CBSG did in terms of its own uh, population and habitat uh, viability analysis. Uh, and uh, we have targets uh, built into uh, the SSC strategic plan for this uh, forthcoming quadrennium. Uh, and so we see the species planning cycle as this. Uh, it's really very simple. Uh, the planning side, you have to measure the scope or define the scope of your meeting. You need to have a vision then for your species or group of species, whatever it is. Um, you need to go in with a very good review of the status of the species and the threats it faces. Uh, and then at the workshop itself, you start developing the vision, and that leads to the goals and the objectives and the actions. It's a very logical, straightforward sequence, and it's very similar to any project development uh, and so on. And then of course we have the implementation uh, stage um, of implementation which must be monitored, the outcomes must be assessed, that leads to adaptive management uh, which may or may not cause you to revise your goals and objectives uh, or even your vision if it needs radical change. And one of the workshops I was at this morning emphasized the fact that we Conservation does not take enough risks. We need to have more failures because we can learn from them. And the business world expects to see failure, and perhaps we should learn from them a bit more. Um, sorry about some of this, um, the formatting on here. It's, it's got lost in the transition between different, um, different computers. Um, now, this is quite logical and quite easy. And of course, we're concerned really with the planning stage. But there's a slight issue here in that uh, we help specialist groups and others to do the planning, but we're not really concerned with implementation. And one of our challenges is to uh, say, well, how can we be legitimately involved in implementation, or at least track it, so that we can see that it is uh, on stream. Uh, there's no point in our doing the planning if we're not then optimistic or even able to help the implementation and the achievement of our objectives. Uh, and one uh, answer to this dilemma in a way is to make sure that the actions are, each action uh, is, account is accompanied by someone who is accountable for that and also responsible. So if you say more, uh, so many more hectares to be added to a national park within the next two years, then you say, well, who's going to be responsible for doing that? And if it's not done, who is accountable? And in that way, it does really focus uh, particularly governments on getting plans done. And uh, in some cases, in uh, plans done at the regional level in Africa for the cheetah and the wild dog, they've actually appointed a regional coordinator. And this is someone who then is responsible for holding governments and NGOs accountable for the actions that they've agreed to. And it needs a very special sort of person who is very diplomatic and firm, who can go to governments and say, look, you said you'd do this, you haven't done it, or time is running out, when are you going to start? But in that way, you can rather hold people's uh, feet to the fire. 
So where have we used this methodology? Uh, these are some of the species that we have already uh, done planning for over the last sort of year and a half. Um, geographically quite varied, but you'll notice that they are mostly large mammals. Uh, but because of uh, the interest of one of our committee members, who's now in the IUCN Secretariat, we've done a frog in Madagascar uh, and also a chameleon. So we can say that we have some experience with amphibians and reptiles. Uh, and uh, earlier this year, of course, we got our first aquatic species in sawfish, uh, which you're going to hear a lot more about shortly. Um, but the trouble is, of course, there's an obvious omission here is that we uh, have not done any planning yet for plants, but we've got several ideas on the uh, underway. Uh, and these are some of the species to be planned uh, for over the next year. And uh, these are partly we've chosen them because of the variety of situations the species find themselves in. Uh, and the um, crayfish, for example, um, is suffering uh, from mining development. It's going to lose its habitat. Uh, the brown howler monkey uh, is facing diseases, human emergent disease. Uh, the humphead wrasse has a serious problem of uh, overcatching on, on the reefs, uh, being uh, brought up and then um, uh, traded internationally commercially. So that's a large sighting issue. Uh, the Western Derby Island is just very low numbers in the park. Uh, one park in Senegal uh, and the Asian buffalo is at very low numbers uh, in central India. So we're trying to develop the, te the methodology under a very wide variety of situations. Uh, John, is that really my time? Oh, sorry, you showed a large thing that said stop. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I should get a game back. kind of power I have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just observing. Right, let's carry on then. So now we're going to look at two, uh, two very different case histories uh, where we've applied the planning process. Uh, and the first is to Djibouti. Uh, and here's just an aid. It's a very small country indeed, probably the smallest country in Africa. Uh, it's uh, very small, it's uh, arid or indeed hyper arid, uh, and it sits in the Horn of Africa hotspot. Uh, conservation is uh, the whole process of conservation is as yet very underdeveloped there. And uh, there was an initiative started by a French zoo to do some conservation planning to help Djiboutian biodiversity. And this zoo had actually repatriated already some Djibouti animals from the zoo back into the country. Uh, and to be kept in semi-confined conditions. There were also interests from local NGO, which again was largely expatriate driven, but the government also wanted to start doing some conservation planning. So, and the government was extremely keen to, to get this done. So the government invited the conservation breeding specialist group to organize and run the meeting. Uh, I then involved three specialist groups uh, for equids, for antelopes, and for galliforms to join in, and also got the Eastern and Southern African Regional Office of IUCN also to get involved. And it was quite evident early on that there was a very diverse group of agendas here. The different organizations wanted different things out of the meeting, and it needed quite a lot of delicate groundwork over several months to define the scope of the meeting itself. And in the end, uh, we came up with some things called Djibouti's priority, priority terrestrial animals. And this was a fairly arbitrary set of species. Uh, and as you see, they're all large mammals, apart from the Djibouti Franklin, uh, which is actually the only true endemic species in the country. So that had to go in. So it was not mammals, but it was animals. And the criteria for selection really were endemism in the form of the Franklin, uh, national heritage, they were proud of these species, uh, the interest of the zoos who had already repatriated some animals, uh, there had been already some extinctions in the country, the Grevy zebra was no longer found, and the oryx had also gone extinct in the last few years. Uh, and obviously there were conservation threats and needs for those other species. So we had this rather arbitrary set of species, but in the end it didn't matter. The meeting was hugely successful in bringing together a very large group of people, large numbers of Djiboutians. The government was both hugely supportive and very generous in its support. Um, the government said, this is wonderful. Can we now do plants? And can we please do marine species? And even tried to get them in the same meeting. That had to be said no. Um, and there was great public interest. And also the uh, IUCN regional office got involved in the country again, the 
the first time after many years. So we have a number of lessons already learned from our planning, uh, and in a way they're quite obvious. <clears throat> Local culture is extremely important. It's for understanding what you're doing, how to carry out the workshop, what people expect out of it. As I said, we have to have accountability, responsibility for actions. Uh, the process has to be cyclical, you have to start implementing, see what's happened, is it working, go back and revisit your planning or indeed even your objectives. Uh, and we've also tried to encourage people, set up a mechanism whereby SSC will endorse conservation plans that are basically carried out not following our approach as a cookbook, but following the principles of it. And if it's done in a rational, thorough way, then SSC will endorse it. And the hope is that if we've endorsed it, it will help governments endorse those plans and also help maybe get funding to implement them. So that's what I'm going to say now. We're going to move to our second case history. And uh, Nick Dalby from the uh, Shark Specialist Group, co-chair, is going to come and talk about the swordfish. traditional species conservation planning, we're typically dealing with one or two species or one or two locations. When we start moving the planning process into the marine environment, we are faced I don't want to lift, lift it up. We are faced with the challenge that we're often dealing with complexes of species and we're dealing with their distribution which can often span the waters of many nations. And this is one such case study, the case study of swordfishes. At the moment we have seven species, and all seven species are critically endangered. They're the most threatened group of marine fishes in the world today. And this photograph doesn't really indicate the true problem that swordfishes face. And I'll illustrate that to you by asking Lucy Harrison, who's led all this work, to stand up. So sawfishes are seven meters long, which is the distance from my hand to Lucy's head. <laughs> <laughs> now, size is everything in the marine environment, and size tends to correlate strongly with a very slow life history. And this is one of the slowest life histories in the world. They are live bearing, and they give birth to live young. But they nourish their young with an ovum, not a placenta. And that ovum is possibly the largest ovum in the animal kingdom. It's the size of a grapefruit or a softball, and certainly rivals the size of the egg of an emu. The second problem that they have is a problem that they can't escape, which is their diagnostic toothed rostra, as you can see in this photograph, and their distribution. They're found in shallow coastal waters in the tropical seas and the subtropical seas. And this combination of high vulnerability to entanglement in nets used in these waters, combined with their so slow life history, um, renders them vulnerable to high risk of extinction. Here we can see a capture of a sawfish taken in Kerala in India last year, which was close to seven meters long. And you can see the entanglement problem. Often these animals are so heavily entangled, it's impossible to cut them out and release them alive. So where did we start with this? Well, the point of departure was really to figure out where these animals were distributed. And we engaged a series of partners and a series of activities to draw out all of the available museum and newspaper records from countries around the world. And we aggregated this data into Tristis species. We couldn't necessarily break it out easily by individual species. And we had an identifier for a year on country. So with that, we figured out in how many countries sawfishes were found 200 years ago. And we found that sawfishes were present in more than 80 nations around the world. With the date, we could figure out how many records there have been in the last decade. So the red areas show you where there have been no records of sawfishes in the last decade. To give you an indication of the scale of decline in records, there have only been four records in West Africa in the last decade. So this was part of the network building process, and we were very proactive in building our network. We solicited information from many fisheries agencies and environmental agencies around the world, and used a snowballing approach to build a network. And we managed to gather 134 people from 50 countries. 
A subset of these people managed to come to our workshop held in London Zoo in May this year where we undertook both registering and conservation planning. And this group consisted of taxonomists, biologists, fishery scientists, people from Aquaria, and policy advisors. This is the distribution of countries where those participants came from. And here in blue shows the distribution of the network members who couldn't make it to the meeting, who also contributed knowledge to the planning process. So as Mark has pointed out, the planning process requires a vision, and our vision is for a world where robust sawfish and sawfishes are restored in a thriving aquatic ecosystem. And that vision is delivered through goals and concrete time-bound actions, and our time horizon is to achieve this vision by 2020. This shows the map of the current strongholds of sawfishes in green. So you can see that there's a secure population in Florida due to extensive protection efforts there, and largely unsecured, unsecured populations, but still thriving populations in northern Australia. Elsewhere, sawfish populations are in trouble. The countries in dark grey show you where there is some national protection for sawfish.